Okay. Well, good morning. Yeah. Thank you for joining us this morning on a snowy day at the Human Service Training Center. My name is Michelle Camacho. I'm one of the associate directors that works here with Bureau of Training and Development at OCFS. Thank you for joining us to celebrate the agency's 2024 observation of National Day of Racial Healing. This year's theme asks us how we heal from the effects of racism. Today's conversation is a panel discussion with Acting Commissioner Suzanne Miles Gustav and the staff from the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility Office. I'm looking forward to today's conversation on racial healing and how we can take the individual and collective desire for a more equitable society and harness it into action. So let's get started. At this time, I'd like to welcome Acting Commissioner Suzanne Miles Gustav to the podium to kick us off with some more opening remarks. to be here with you all. I'm sure we have some folks live streaming as well. So good morning to all of our colleagues here at the HSLC, Auditorium, and all those joining us virtually. <laughs> um, we're welcome to OCFS's second annual National Day of Racial Healing Program. Um, this annual observance is hosted by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation and was created with and built on the work and learnings of the truth racial healing and transformation community partners. So fundamental to this day is a clear understanding that racial healing is at the core of racial equity. This day is observed every year on the Tuesday after MLK Day. The National Day of Racial Healing is a time to contemplate our shared values and create the blueprint together for how we heal from the effects of racism. Launched in 2017, this day is really an opportunity to bring all folks together in their common humanity and inspire collective action to create a more just and equitable world. But in order for there to be true healing, there must also be an understanding that certain communities have been disproportionately oppressed and marginalized. It is incumbent upon those who have benefited from these long-standing societal structures to fully commit to confronting and redressing past harms. This is OCFS, as mentioned, second part in this nationwide call to action. I'm so glad we're participating. It is important that OCFS join so many other organizations, schools, campuses, and communities across the country in organizing an event that empowers us to spend time with one another and really have real authentic conversations about how to continue the healing process from the reality that is racism in America. It's a critical conversation to have and one that I hope will help us set the tone going forward this year as we work each day to provide services to the families and children of New York. There really cannot be equitable delivery of services without an acknowledgement and true understanding of racism and the need to build a human services system that is meant to empower rather than apologize. I'm looking forward to participating in uh, today's panel. So with that, no further ado, I'll turn it over to Angelica Kang, our Chief DIA Officer. Good morning. Thank you. And join us as a panelist, yeah. <laughs> So good morning, everybody. It's so good to have you here. And we're going to kick off today's discussion, the day after we've honored Dr. King, um, with what we have been talking about as the Equity and Justice Plug Pledge. So some of you have a packet in hand. We also have a QR code that you can follow to reach this pledge and the toolkit that we've created to help accomplish the goals of the pledge. And I wanted to um, introduce it to you guys with a little bit of history. Um, if you know me by now, you know that I'm very transparent and I love to tell people the story of how we got to here, right? So um, our office, the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility has discussed this pledge for uh, over a year now, I believe, and we really wanted a way to concretely give people some action steps to really doing the work. Like we get this question all the time, like how do you do the work? Doing the work meaning dismantling racism in the system, um, 
delivering services equitably, implementing equitable policies, or writing equitable policies, drafting them that way. And so we get this question all the time, how do you do the work? And um, I think we have often felt too that it can be very daunting, right? If you're just one person and we're fighting systemic oppression, systemic racism, how do you do that? And so we wanted to create a pledge with some concrete commitments to help folks feel like there's more than just the saying, but there's actually a roadmap to how to do this. A little bit of history is that we, um, OCFS was working with OGS and the Division of Human Rights um, in helping plan some of the events for um, honoring Dr. King's legacy last Monday. And we began to draft this pledge with uh, the Division of Human Rights. So you will see this pledge again in the spring through the Division of Human Rights. They're calling it an anti-hate and bias pledge. The language is the same because we're the ones who drafted it. <laughs> but we decided to call it an equity and justice pledge because I believe anti-hate and anti-bias is, is part and parcel of the entire journey towards equity and justice. So we're gonna start today's conversation on how do we heal rooting ourselves in our pledge. And then um, there are some concrete, even more concrete steps that go with these commitments that we can take collectively as an agency. But we're gonna start today's conversation out with the pledge and breaking down those commitments. And our esteemed panelists are here to help discuss how does this look to them in, in an individual way um, on a daily basis. So I'm, I'm really excited to be able to do this because as we were planning this event, you know, we always start out with what are we going to do? What is it going to look like? And as many of you folks know, DEIA has been growing and we've got more staff. And I think maybe at least once a week, at more than once a week, but at least once a week, you know, we all pop our heads up like little gophers <laughs> from our cubes and we start talking like on any of these subjects. And it's just been so wonderful to have a team of people who know that these conversations are critical mm -hmm. and we are, and we kind of recognized earlier that we are multi-generational, multi-racial, multicultural. And we wanted to engage with the acting commissioner to invite her into this space to have this, these conversations that we've been having. And a hope here is that not only are we modeling how to have the conversations, or we're not only having the conversations, but we're modeling how to have them. And we encourage you to take this experience with you back to your communities, your office spaces, amongst your friends, amongst your colleagues, and to attempt the same conversation. It won't look exactly the same, but um, this is this is doing the work. This is giving it a try. I have no idea how they're going to answer our questions, but that's the point, right? Every individual comes into this with their strengths and with their backgrounds and their abilities, and it's about creating a community of practitioners in which we engage in this work together. So hopefully that all makes sense. Um, if we'll go to the next slide to show the pledge, I believe that's the next slide but you also have your packets that will um, show you which eight commitments there are. Um, and then as we pull that up, I also wanna have our panelists introduce themselves. I mean, well, we know the acting commissioner. I don't know if you <laughs> have to introduce yourself <laughs> further. <laughs> then we have Kresha. Hi, good morning. I'm Kresha Real. pronouns she, hers. I'm the program manager in the DEIA office. Morning, everyone. Galen Gomes Sr. and I am uh, the equity um, advocate in the office. I use he and pronouns. Great. Good morning. My name is Karen Sessions. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the first ever OCFS SOCHI officer, which stands for Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, and Expression. So happy to be here among my colleagues today. And again, I'm Angelica Kang. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Chief Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility Officer, and I'll be acting as your moderator today. So as we see, we have um, our first half of the pledge up on the screen, also in your packet. And with the first commitment to, um, you know, to, to the Equity and Justice Pledge is to acknowledge the existence and intergenerational impacts of injustice, hate, prejudice, and systemic racism and continually educate myself and others about these issues. And so what does that mean? Um, I'm going to let our panelists 
jump in and let us know um, why do you think it's necessary to acknowledge that systemic racism exists? I, I'm not down in the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so I just got a whole bunch of questions. Okay, I will yeah, start. I'll collect questions. Um, start. Why is it uh, necessary to acknowledge that systemic racism exists is because racial reconciliation happens, um, I believe, with healing first, and healing requires truth. And so you're going to have to address uh, the truth of the situation, the truth of the history, um, have a common foundation of that truth to then begin the healing process. So. I, I think if you don't have truth as a core tenet, be very difficult to move forward, especially with trust and uh, with healing. And if we're talking about, you know, how do we heal? You have to have the truth to heal. There has to be some um, common ground there and some moral clarity, I will say. Mm -hmm. When do you, and just like a follow up, we weren't born knowing, right? We weren't born knowing that systemic racism is real. I mean, for some of us, it's very fast that the reality of it enters our lives. And then for some of us, it takes a little bit of a longer time. So um, I wanna know from the panel, you know, that journey for you as to when did racism become a thing that you saw as like an individual action? Because you hear people say, I'm not a racist, right? It's an individual thing. But then we talk about systemic racism. So what was it like for you to have that transition between knowing that racism exists as an individual action to something systemic? And what resources got you there? And what resources do you continually feel like you need to understand systemic racism? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> well, I think I'm first by taking a step back to the first question to say, um, the reason why we have to acknowledge it, because if you don't, then you are doing a disservice to the lived experience of those who are disproportionately affected by it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's first and foremost. For me, I think, um, if I can answer this correctly with what you're asking, my first encounter with it personally, um, I think I was six or seven years old. And I was at, um, I was at a department store with my mother and um, an older um, white woman was there with her, I believe it was her granddaughter, and she had put her purse down, and uh, the granddaughter put the purse down, and the grandmother noticed and came over, and I heard her say to her, can't do that, you can't trust these people. Mm -hmm. So me at six years old, seven years old, very impressionable, you know, I turned to my mother and I asked her, well, like, you know, what is she talking about? What does this mean? And, you know, at that moment, my mother took a second to explain to me. She said, some people are just, you know, you know, I can't remember the words to you. Basically, some people are ignorant, and that's just how they, they act. Um, for me, it became systemic, um, probably about 13 years old. So when I was a youth myself, I started working as a youth counselor at the Arbor Hill Community Center. So this at the time, um, for those of you who are familiar with the area, this is when Arbor Hill was Arbor Hill, you know, um, where before they put in the one-way streets to deter mm -hmm. traffic and drug trafficking and all that, stuff happened right in front of you. And at 13 years old, I noticed that the community center was filled with individuals who looked just like me, but had different experiences to me, but all similar. Um, you know, I was blessed and had the benefit of growing up in a, in a close-knit family, a close-knit community, and I had certain, you know, privileges. But by working in that capacity, I quickly learned just how disproportionate some groups of people were compared to others. So I think for me, that's where it became a real understanding of what, at the time, I didn't know it was systemic. I didn't know that term, but that made it real to me. Mm. I would say around the same age, six or seven, for me, uh, the individual experiences. Um, and I think this is probably going to sound strange, but my parents were immigrants, so um, they always othered African Americans, <laughs> and you know that was kind of my first introduction to it. Was kind of in my household, where they were like, "Well, we're not going to be like that. We're going to be disciplined. We're going, you know, all these implicit biases that they had." And 
um, discriminatory language towards the uh, Black Americans that were here. That's what they called them, was the Black Americans. <laughs> and we were African Americans. Um, and so they like wanted me to in make sure that they were there was a distinction. But I think for them, it mostly came from like a cultural distinction. But um, it wasn't until high school where I realized there was systemic issues going on. And it was actually because I was a, when I was applying to um, colleges, um, I happened to have a really great um, guidance counselor who stayed my guidance counselor the whole time I was there. But um, on some of the research that I was doing for my writing my essay, <laughs> that's when I really started to understand, um, you know, and some of my friends, um, my black friends in high school um, were not applying to as many colleges as me and, you know, just couldn't afford certain things and et cetera. Like Gail and I was privileged to have like very hardworking parents. Um, but it wasn't until some of that research I was doing on mental health that I really started to understand some of the systemic barriers to treatment. <laughs> um, and that's what I ended up writing my essay about. If I can add, I will add that um, strangely, I felt a difference. Like I was different when I was about four. And that's so odd to even, mm -hmm reflect but um it was an othering situation i was with my family at a roller skating rink but weird like seems super agnostic it wasn't a negative experience these two little white girls would not leave me alone like they were like not in a bad way like oh my god she's so pretty but like hands in the hair yeah. and i didn't know what all that meant back then it was super objectifying i didn't know what all that meant and yes, maybe I thought I was cute, that's fine. But I was like the only black girl mm -hmm. in that roller skating rink and they would not leave me alone. And at four, I wasn't, you know, I didn't feel like I should be left alone. I was like, oh, they're paying attention to me. But right, reflecting on, I knew I felt a way about it, but couldn't, right, I didn't have the words mm -hmm. to, or the motions to even articulate that. Um, and then I think it really hit home to both of my colleagues' point. I also grew up in an all black neighborhood in Queens, it was clear we were all together, right? There were no white people that lived in my neighborhood. I went to an all black school, both elementary and high school. And right, things weren't as safe, weren't as nice at my high school. Um, and I started to get into art. And through my art, I was able to articulate to your point, Amanda, um, like what resources did you go to to help you understand further. And it was through my art that I started to read and I got familiar familiar with all the black authors because I was in a really good English class in my all black high school. <laughs> but um, so I got to, I got that knowledge pretty early on in high school and was able to funnel that through my art in high school and then through college. Yeah. So what's interesting as a non-white and a non-black person uh, for me, um, the racism that I know I have experienced as well as inherited is anti-blackness. Mm -hmm. So I would even say that, you know, it's not just racism, it's an anti-blackness mm -hmm. that started that my, my immigrant parents in needing to survive and assimilate, which assimilation was something that was really pushed onto us as immigrants. Mm -hmm. They really adopted an anti-black attitude. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that. But then what's also interesting is that because there was such an erasure of the Asian Americans in, in, in history, in school, I mean, they never talked about Asians unless it was in this kind of exotified way. Um, as I realized that I could not align myself with whiteness because I wasn't even allowed to, white people didn't see me as white, I was gravitating towards aspects of like black culture, like hip hop and, and art and music. Um, I would, I, um, South, going to South Africa was a really big part of that experience, like kind of trying to find liberation in black movement because there just had not been discussion of Asian Americans and our journey towards equality. And so it's always been a very interesting experience to have been so rooted in anti-blackness, but then to seek my liberation in black mm -hmm. culture, mm -hmm. which is not mine to take either. So then there's also this journey of then not appropriating other people's cultures and other people's journeys and stories and really asking myself, what does it mean to be Asian and American and to be part of this? 
Um, and we're still on commitment one, but I don't want to avoid <laughs> words that all the words are very intentional here. So I want to hit on intergenerational. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to put Karen a little bit on the spot here because um, we haven't spoken yet. <laughs> so <laughs> what does, um, and I know you didn't volunteer to answer this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. No How, so when we think, so a lot of these questions that you'll see there's a discussion guide. All these questions that we're asking are in the discussion guide. And you'll see that many of these questions will ask you to think about yourself, but then also think about your colleague, right? So there mm -hmm. is the question of how has the intergenerational impact of racism impacted your life? And, or how do you think it impacts the different individuals in your life? So thinking about how it impacts you and then perhaps even the person sitting next to you. Is there a difference? Is it the same? What do, you know, when you think about the intergenerational impact of racism, what does that mean? Uh, so I, I was going to jump in. I wanted to <laughs> add, and, and this is a perfect segue, um, you know, as the, the white woman sitting on this stage and hearing examples of individuals reflecting on the first experience of racism or forms of discrimination, and then, you know, I will share growing up in a very white community and having limited interactions with individuals of color. But yet there was a knowing that there was a difference in how people were treated. And I have to really think and reflect on my own childhood, my own family, the way we move through the world and our community and how that may have been different and privileged in comparison to others' experiences. And so when you start to do that exploration, you will find examples. And sitting with that is important for all of us to do and to reflect. And so adding to and bringing it to the intergenerational piece, I would say the weight is there. And we all, if we look for it, it's there. And so what I, I try to always think about and the, the, the conversations that we have and the things that we share, we bring it back to the work. And you know, I think about the experiences over long periods of time historically and, and we work for state government, we work for an institution that has impacted those we are trying to help and not harm. And so I, I feel like I probably need to sit with this a bit more to really give you my own personal answer. But what I will say is that it's a knowing that what we have done, we can't undo, but we can work to move forward and create a path forward. And I think we have to we have to look back and reflect and validate the experiences of others um, and the harm that has been caused. Um, so I'll pause there, but. Yeah, thank you. So that segues us to commitment two. We're moving along, we're gonna get there. <laughs> so commitment two of the pledge is to understand that all forms of inequality are mutually reinforcing and work to eradicate all forms of inequity, division and discrimination. Um, and for those of you who may have a little bit of background or studied the, um, these concepts, this might sound familiar because this is talking about intersectionality, if that term is familiar to you all, but it's basically the concept of how these forms of inequality are mutually reinforcing. So what does, um, what do you know, so panelists, what do you know about intersectionality and why do you think that some people disdain the concept so much. <laughs> I hope, you know, I'll offer that to the second part. I think maybe why some folks disdain it is because they don't yet see the actualization of their own as yet. Mm. You know, mm. uh, regardless of background, regardless of your ethnicity, you know, so-called race, um, there's intersections within all of us and maybe those individuals just haven't taken the time maybe they've been in a privileged state long enough to where they haven't had to do so so therefore they they haven't come to terms yet with their own intersections mm -hmm. <laughs> um, 
I love this question, Angelica. And also, right, I can talk about this all day long. We had this conversation, so I'm so glad we're able to share them with you. Um, the pledge in itself, which is why every single pledge is so, um, it's so critical that we break it down so that everyone understands what we're doing and why we're doing it. And again, this is a wonderful call to action because that intersectionality um, is uh, fundamental to this conversation because all of the isms, all the isms we talk about, racism, sexism, ageism, ableism, um, all counteract the white dominant culture, right? So we talked about, hopefully you heard that term before, white dominant culture or white supremacy. And unfortunately, the, re the way, the reason intersectionality was so famed when it was um, this, conveyed by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, and don't quote me what year, <laughs> because there's been such infighting mm -hmm. with people who've experienced there is a like mm -hmm. racism doesn't exist, but sexism is real, right? Patriarchy, mm -hmm. all of it contradicts or tries to that dominant culture, that concept that white male dominated societies have created most of the rules for the rest of the world. Right, and then the other people, <laughs> the folks that are othered, um, have suffered at the hands and decisions of that dominant culture. So understanding that as a black woman, I experience anti-black racism, but I also experience sexism, mm -hmm. right? Patriarchy rules my life. I get paid less than other white women. I get paid than less than other, less than white men in any industry. Right, and so it's important that we don't, we don't just talk about the racism, although this is National Day Racial Healing Day, <laughs> but we are all suffering from other isms because the dominant culture is embedded, hence the systems, right? It's systemic because it's embedded. And I think it's important to have these conversations and understand how we all have a part. All of us have a part. We've all experienced white dominant culture in ways that have not benefited us but we don't all realize it. So the intersectionality is critical, I think, because of that. And it's important that we know and understand, hence Pledge 1 and 2, acknowledge and understand how you are impacted by all these, these processes. Yeah, it's very good. Now, just to add, you know, to marry you guys' two points, um, you know, about what do I know about intersectionality? I knew I was experiencing multiple forms, but it wasn't until I learned about that term in grad college <laughs> that I was like, that's it. <laughs> that explains it. But it's very difficult for us as humans to, um, and this is why I think people disdain it to the second portion of the question is because it's difficult for us to quantify our experience. <laughs> we want to put things into boxes. We want it to be clear cut. We want it to be black or white. So intersectionality is the gray. And um, it, it's what muddles everything together. It's like a pot of gumbo, <laughs> you know? Um, and that's difficult for humans to wrap their mind around. You know, you don't wanna be fighting multiple forms of discrimination at once, right? You, and that's just sometimes how we also approach racial healing. We wanna focus on this one specific area first. Um, but as you move along and, and, and you're doing the work, you realize it's not an or, it's an and. Mm -hmm. And so that's the whole tenement of intersectionality is that it's and, 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 and. Um, and that's tough for us to do. We don't like to do it. And you know, it also requires us to go uh, below the surface. There's only, you can look at an individual and come up with what you perceive to be some of their intersection, but there's so much that you can't tell on yeah. the surface mm -hmm. that that person, that individual has grown up in, has grown up dealing with, is still trying to come to terms with themselves at this point maybe. So I think the fact that um, so much of it is uh, quote unquote invisible, um, probably is uncomfortable mm -hmm. to folks mm -hmm. and maybe even, uh, maybe even in some ways threatening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll say my my, per, my first in, in experience of learning about intersectionality was in law school. Where I had a professor who started out almost every class reminding us that we all had points of privilege and points of oppression. Mm -hmm. And I did not like that the first time I heard it. As a Asian American woman in law school where there were not that many of me. And then 
many of us were, uh, all, many of the other Asian Americans in law school were um, not in the public interest track that I was in. And I remember I disdained the idea of intersectionality because I felt like I was losing a part of my identity. I realized that part of my identity was the suffering, mm. was the othering. Mm. And it was strange that I had so little options for who I could be that I would rather hold on to the idea that I was oppressed mm -hmm. than to realize that I had been complicit in the oppression mm -hmm. of others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was a really big moment for me because I wanted to walk out of that class. And she just reminded me, you want to walk out, go ahead, you can. Mm -hmm. That's your privilege, you know, right? Yeah. That's a privilege yeah. that I could get up and walk yeah. out if I wanted to, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was a moment for me. Um, and what I love about, you know, the pledge and commitment to equity and justice that it's liberation for everybody. Mm -hmm. It is to free yourself from being the victim of suffering and of racism and of the identity of a person who is oppressed. Yeah. So that was um, an embarrassing moment because I was an older law student. <laughs> I was older than many of my <laughs> classmates and I was so sure of myself at that moment. And so it's it's part of the humbling experience. Yeah. yeah. You know, if I can add to that, and I think what you shared, I, I feel like I learned something in what you just shared just now, in that we have to do the work. You know, we have to put ourselves in a position to be humbled. Um, and for anyone that's hearing me um, and is, you know, maybe thinking like, these are experiences that I'm less familiar with, or I'm not sure where, how I would answer these questions, because I'm not exactly sure either. You know, that's to me a call to, for me to do my work okay. and to begin to build what I see as a lens in intersectionality. It's a seeing the depth of someone's experiences and some I may be able to identify with and others I may not. And for the parts that I'm at a knot, that's for me to want to lean in and, and be curious and educate myself. So that's an invitation. Really. And again, you're really good at the segues. <laughs> you're, you're helping me segue to commitment three. Commitment three is to combat intolerance and drive out fear by actively creating an environment of safety, justice, and equity wherever I am. And so for the panelists, I'm going to kind of squeeze a bunch of these questions together for the interest of time. But when you get in your discussion groups, feel free to just focus on one a week even. You know, mm -hmm. these questions generate a lot. In what ways does intolerance and fear show up in your day, your everyday existence? How does that impact you and your ability to get work done? And then the third part, um, when you envision an environment of safety, justice, and equity, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. So what is your experience like now? And then what do you envision it to be? Oh my goodness. My experience, <laughs> it does show up every day because when I wake up and I leave my house, well, actually before I even leave my house sometimes mm -hmm. because I am married to a white man. <laughs> so um, sometimes it shows up before I leave my house. <laughs> and then when I do leave my house, immediately shows up because wherever I go, there I am and I present as a black woman. And so, you know, it could be from getting gas in the morning, going into the store, parking my car. <laughs> uh, you know, I get um, intolerant sometimes, just people look at me like, why are you driving that car? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been pulled over and been asked, is this my car? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so when I envision um, safety and justice, what that looks like. I think the first thing that comes to mind is that people listen to me when I talk. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where the convergence of like being a woman and being black sometimes happens. And it's a double whammy where folks don't um, listen to you uh, when you talk um, or when you have an expertise in a specific area, it's still questioned. And so that obviously slows the work down. 
And if you're not in it for the long haul, <laughs> you're going to be very frustrated off the bat because this is long suffering. This is, this is work that um, is, is life work. So it, it slows the work down. You have to be okay with the pace. Whatever inro inroads you're making at that pace is still, you're still taking a step forward. It's not taking a step back. But I think the most important thing was just the validation of experience and being able to people hearing me when I talk. And one example, and this is, <laughs> I recently just watched um, Beyonce film of her tour mm -hmm. and something similar happened in the movie where she was asking about um, a camera, a, a certain length of a camera and she manages and directs and everything the tour, right? She's a creative mastermind. And she was saying this to, I don't know, a production manager or something, someone who's running the tech and they were like, that doesn't exist. And she goes, I just looked it up, it does. <laughs> so it's things like that. When I envision a place of safety and equity and justice, I imagine just being hurt. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Can I add to that, Precious, just by saying like, the idea of safety is something that I think for white individuals is taken for granted. That everyone in all spaces and the work that we do and where we go, that we're all safe. And that safety looks and feels the same. And and it's not the case. And even in our, you know, I want to, I keep thinking about in the work and in, in the, the collective work that we do with each other. And as we grow and move throughout the organization, it is not necessarily the case. And it's important for all of us to be cognizant of that. And what can we do to create that safety? Um, and, and the one thing is not to assume that it's there for all and that there's trust. Um, I think I learned a huge lesson in, in wide apps, having an open conversation with staff where that piece was driven home uh, around uh, individuals not necessarily feeling safe. And when white individuals in the room are not sharing or asking questions or commenting, that that doesn't necessarily contribute to creating more safety. Mm -hmm. When we're not exposing our own vulnerability of not knowing, that, that, is, that creates a tentative situation for all, really. Um, so again, I, I share that because it was a life lesson for me um, and it's about being able to be honest with where you're at and say what, what you know in the moment with an openness to, you know, gaining something from those around you. Um, so I just wanted to share that. Yeah, I think, um, uh, in here and Karen, what came to mind is that, um, individuals, so a call to action, if you will, a challenge, a call to action is to, uh, be conscious of the safeties that you take for granted. Um, so for me, I think the safety aspect is a psychological. You know, um, for the most part, I, I'll show up anywhere and I feel physically safe. Yes, there's certain places I go where maybe I have to be on my P's and Q's more than others, but for the most part, I show up physically safe. But I also know that when I show up in certain spaces and I show up with women in those spaces, they show up maybe feeling differently than I do when it comes to the physical safety. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely times where I go out of my way to make sure I try to create a sense in a space for them to feel safe. And that's as simple as at the end of the workday, walking somebody to their car, mm -hmm. making sure there's a group of people, making sure um, that I even voice that to them. But for me personally, the, the safety that comes most challenging for me and the one that I probably want to uh, highlight the most is the psychological mm -hmm. because again that's the part that's hidden mm -hmm. um, and you know we all go through experiences we all have struggle moments but the psychological piece of the piece that can be the lasting piece you know bumps and bruises can fade mm -hmm. for the most part but the psychological piece can last and that's the generational mm -hmm. that's how that intergeneration comes into play Mm -hmm. Can I just no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> I'm moving on before you do that. Um, to thank you all. I agree with everything that my wonderful colleagues have said. 
But to piggyback on Precious's comment about being heard, right, just as a black woman, I've experienced that my entire career. Um, but I want to say now I know my privilege mm -hmm. and I have a sense of power. There's a foundation for many, many things, right? Mm -hmm. But to the extent I can share that power because I have this privilege of leadership, um, I try to create that safe space as best I can as a black woman who also doesn't feel safe. Mm -hmm. And still, oftentimes, I'm not heard, right? Regardless of the level of power you have. Um, but I, cho I choose to take, acknowledge and share my power to the best of my ability so that create spaces that are safe when I hire a bunch of black people to the extent I can, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When I help promote people of color that have not been at the tables that decisions are made historically, right? That's how we create safety. We, that's diversity. We put more voices at the table so that everyone understands all the perspectives and we can create that collective safe, just environment. That's the hope. Yeah. And to further that example, I, I, you know, these gestures can be huge and they can be simple and small to the point, um, to the acting commissioner's point, like the first time I had to go to the governor's mansion for one of those fancy little lunches. <laughs> I, you know, I have social anxiety. I did not want to go. I'm, you know, I don't know anybody. I don't even know what the protocol is. <laughs> and you accompanied me. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was safety because mm -hmm. suddenly I didn't feel so alone and I wasn't so worried about who am I do like, what am I doing here? Do I belong here? Because that's a question I ask myself all the time. And so I, and I bring that up, not just to like, you know, toot your horn or whatever, but to show that it, it's as simple sometimes as knowing your power and knowing that I have this position and all I have to do is kind of extend my wing a little bit and provide some security and assurance in that way. So we're talking about big, big things and little things as well. We're going to move on to the bigger things. Can I just real quick? Oh, yeah. There's something I wanted to highlight. Um, you know, we can, another discussion, we can delve further into this, but I think there's something that the commissioner highlighted that begs for a pause. And again, it speaks to the psychological safety. You're an individual who knows you're not safe in certain spaces and you're trying to create safety for others in those same spaces. Mm -hmm. And just the dichotomy that exists of yeah. that mm -hmm. and trying to come to terms with that and how you do that for someone else, yet yes. you don't yet feel it for mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think that just begs a pause for folks yes. to really take a moment and sit with that. Yeah. For sure. I was almost going to say the same thing to you because we were talking about this before the panel in terms of being a black man who sometimes your presence alone will scare somebody, mm -hmm. right? Because of people's biases. And so I wanted to ask the question, but I want to keep moving on. So we'll see. Maybe I'll just throw it out there. But, you know, there's this idea of like how much responsibility do you have mm. to be the one who drives out fear? Mm. Well, I think to my, to my, uh, point previously is that's that's where the danger lies where folks don't take the responsibility especially in times where you do have a privilege where you do have a power yeah. when you don't take the time to say okay I might feel this way but somebody else who's here with me doesn't you do have that responsibility well how can we talk about creating a, a, a society even a, a workforce you know of colleagues who can be on one accord as far as you know being equitable and all the things we're, all the tenets we talk about, if we can't take a moment, put ourselves in somebody else's shoes and realize they're probably feeling different than me at this moment, and there's something I can do about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so moving to commitment four, which is the kind of bigger gesture, right, and talk, talking about driving out fear, is uh, commitment four is to pledge to renounce and confront bigotry, extremism, and hateful language and behavior whenever I witness its, uh, its occurrence. And I wanna remind folks that when we say uh, witness its occurrence, we're talking about in live, real life situations, as well as virtual spaces. Um, that's the new frontier, I think, in terms of uh, where a lot of the hurt and the harm can, can exist. And Division of Human Rights, anti-hate and anti-bias pledge or their, their campaign will have a lot to do with the online spaces as well. Um, and so how do we keep ourselves and our partners in equity safe physically and emotionally 
when we are confronting bigotry, bigotry extremism, and hateful language. Uh, I'm just going to put it out there that I this question is driving at the nuance and that we're not asking everybody to just go out like, you know, um, guns blazing, these kinds of guns, not violent guns, but, you know, guns blazing to go and defend everybody because you also, we want to remind folks about the safety aspect. Yeah. Um, I don't know how much time we want to spend on this one because we're running out of time. <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. Um, so I'm going to actually kind of pivot and just zip through the rest of the commitments mm -hmm. yeah. so that we're all clear on them. And then maybe we'll jump back to a couple because I also really want to introduce folks to the toolkit that we created. Mm -hmm. But commitment five, and I think we will have to go to the next slide, is to remain committed to reducing implicit biases and other forms of discrimination. And so this commitment follows the fourth one, which is kind of more about those big, obvious extremist actions. And then we're going to talk about the implicit biases and other forms of discrimination being perhaps the ones that are a little bit more under the surface and not so obvious all the time to everybody. Commitment six is to lead with compassion and allow my learning and actions to be informed by empathy, love, and respect for all individuals. Commitment seven is to mobilize the time, resources, and abilities at my disposal in pursuit of these goals. And the last commitment being to listen to those who are victimized by hate and bias, lend my support, and respect the rights of victims to speak for themselves. And um, so I'm going to go back to, the, to a question uh, related to commitment six, which is leading with compassion and allowing learning and actions to be informed by empathy, love, and respect for all individuals to really um, echo Dr. King. Um, when we talk about love in the workplace, um, what does that mean? How does that make you feel when we talk about love in the workplace? Okay, I'll go. <laughs> I get excited. I get excited. I do love love. Um, and, you know, it begs, I mean, we, we often say this, like, you know, bringing your whole self to work, right? And so for me, that means like bringing the empathetic side of me to work. And it's part of the reason why I got into this work because you can't unsee once you see. Mm -hmm. And so um, to me, love requires um, justice and action and empathy. Um, it's kind of like, again, like the gumbo. <laughs> All of those mixed up in a pop is, is love. And so leading with love means seeing the humanity in um, another person. And hopefully they see that in me as well. So I get excited. Um, and I'm also an emotional person. So I'm always like, I don't want to talk small talk. I want to know like, what was your deepest, darkest fear as a child? <laughs> you know, whatever. So I get excited because we're going past, like Galen mentioned, the, the surface level things and going to the psychological safety and what it is to like bear your heart to one another. And I think it's to remind ourselves that we belong to one another. So when we lead with love, we're reminding ourselves and each other of that fact. I love that. I love love. <laughs> um, and I've said this in a couple of spaces, but we're in the human services industry yeah, yeah. and that's had a dark history, right? Dark past. We talk about repairing mm -hmm. and healing. Um, I hope that you all have made that connection, like repairs at the foundation of reparations, mm -hmm. right? And when, when other entities have considered reparations, we're barely considering it. Well, we're considering New York, but we've not done that as, a, as a, an American society. We've not repaired from the history of enslavement in this country. Other countries have, other entities have for other groups of people like the Native Americans, the indigenous in this country. There are truth and reconciliation mm -hmm. right, committees that, that do just that. In order to repair the harm they've caused to the indigenous population, they set up these reconciliation processes and they are they, they want to hear the truth from the folks that have been harmed that is how you start to heal um, so I would love to be that agency that brings the humanity back into human services right it's why all this is so important to understand why we do what we do and why we talk about redressing the harms that we've done to communities in human services over the decades so leading with love is such an important tenant, um, right? To quote MLK, right? Hate cannot 
uh, drive, uh, drive out hate. Only love can do that, right? So we're trying to combat these right hate and bias and and discrimination. Like we have to lead with love. Only love will fix that. I feel like we should have just broken out into a song. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm trying to be mindful of time. I wanted to like, I wish we could have spent all day doing this, which we should, you should. <laughs> um, and so I do encourage folks to bring these conversations back. And so speaking of love, our office in a great gesture of love to this agency created a toolkit for you to take with you from today moving forward. This toolkit, which um, the team is going to introduce you all to has this packet in there, as well as many, many other resources, but please do take a look at um, the packet where the pledge is, as well as the discussion guide that we, many of the questions that we asked, I went off like script as I always do. Um, I asked some questions that aren't in the discussion guide, but that is, that is the hope is that it will generate this type of conversation um, as often as needed, all the time in your workplaces and knowing um, that it's driven and, and hopefully that it's driven with love at the, at the core. I think that's the way that we will have productive conversations and centering love. Um, and so I would, I do want the team to introduce the toolkit and the pledge, and then we're going to end if, if folks can stay with us for a little bit over, if you can't certainly understand that, but we're going to end with looking at the pledge again and, and providing the opportunity for folks to sign. And if you want to be part of this pledge, you will just sign it. You'll give us the, your information, and we will be following up with you with additional resources. But if you folks want to um, just show the toolkit real fast. Yeah, so this toolkit is uh, completely online. Um, and so you'll see that we have basically opened up the Champions um, SharePoint agency-wide. So it's broken up by a couple different folders, but there is a document that is called, labeled Start Here. And so that'll orient you to um, all of the items that are available. And so just to quickly go through, there are some assessments there, like racial equity assessments. We have our DEIA self-assessment tool that kind of helps you figure out where you are in this journey and begin to start. Um, and the policy author's guide is also there. Obviously that is um, leading with equitable policy development and review. And then we have our champions resource folder, which is really everything that champions has looked at, done, gathered over time since its inception. Um, and then we have the Kellogg Foundations folder. So as we partner with them to put on this uh, event, um, they have a whole host of resources, conversation guides, um, policy tools that you can look at. And so we ported over everything from their site so you don't have to go searching. It's all in one place. And then we have our tools for safe spaces. And so in there, you'll kind of see some posters here like that, um, some visibility tools, because it's a very important to have those things, whether it be at your desk or something like that. But it's a way to, you know, be able to show folks that you're a part of the conversation, you're on this journey, right? Invite people into the space and then we also have a way there for you to request um, pride related items that our office has in stock still and then um, a way to connect with us as Angelica was saying after this if you want to connect with us on these conversations specifically racial healing um, and things like that you'll see that there but that is our toolkit and then this will be um, something that is updated over time as well, right? There's resources coming out every day. And so we don't want you to feel like this will be stoic. It'll be a living space of documents that will be updated. And um, next month, we'll also be continuing that conversation during Black History Month on how do we heal and having some time to really create um, some healing spaces that you wanna. Yeah, so there's a way for you all to take part in that campaign. Um, we have the How You Heal uh, campaign, which is gonna ask individuals, either as an individual or as a group maybe, uh, to share either through word, it could be spoken word, it could be a, a, a essay, it could be music, whatever you have painted that demonstrates to you how we heal. Um, so that's gonna be the, the call to action or the ask of how you can get involved in the campaign as well. So just keep an eye out for that. So thank you so much um, to our panelists and to folks who have joined us in this really critical conversation. Um, we're just going to take one more look at the pledge and provide you all that opportunity. And Michelle's going to 
help us wrap that up. And um, if you have to go, thank you so much for being here. And yeah, I'll turn it over to you, Michelle. Thank you. So in summary, I hereby pledge to acknowledge the existence and intergenerational impacts of injustice, hate, prejudice, and systemic racism, and to continually educate myself and others about these issues. To understand that all forms of inequality are mutually reinforcing, and to work to eradicate all forms of inequity, division, and discrimination. To combat intolerance and drive out fear by actively creating an environment of safety, justice, and equity wherever I am. To renounce and confront bigotry, extremism, and hateful language and behavior whenever I witness its occurrence. To remain committed to reducing implicit biases and other forms of discrimination. To lead with compassion and allow my learning and actions to be informed by empathy, love, and respect for all individuals. To mobilize the time, resources, and abilities at my disposal in pursuit of these goals and to listen to those who are victimized by hate and bias, lend my support and respect the rights of victims to speak for themselves. So as mentioned by Angelica, if you're interested in signing off on that pledge, they are available here. You can sign them, you can leave them at the table, or you can contact the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility to do so as well, which is in the West Building of the Home Office campus. Thank you so much. That pretty much wraps us up. Yay. Um, continue the conversation. We can hang back a little bit for folks who want to keep chatting. Otherwise, have, have, a, have a great day and stay safe out there. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.